grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text in our continuing study of St. Luke's Gospel in the seventh chapter. As Jesus approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother. She was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her. Maybe you are an old guy in the village of Nain. You can't make it out the gate and down the hill to the tombs. Your knees aren't so good anymore. So you <clears throat> sit down on the curb and you wait. You watch the gate. Chances are there aren't many people sitting around you. Almost everybody has gone out that day through the gate, down the hill, to the cemetery. But while you're sitting there, something odd happens. You look up, staring at the gate, and you see one head and then two coming up over the hill. back into the village and you say to yourself well graveside service didn't take as long as usual today and then something else odd strike you people usually don't run back from the committal service at the cemetery and then you see another head and a few more pretty soon there's more people it seems coming in through the gate, then left. And now the crowd is simply pouring through the gate. And they are shouting and smiling and laughing. 
And then you see the mother of the deceased. She must be on some sort of prescription. She's got this big grin on her face. She just took her son out to the cemetery. And so you stand up on your rickety old knees, gawking and staring. You don't even realize that your mouth is hanging open because there is the dead guy. But he's not dead anymore. And he's coming back for his own funeral luncheon. And amid all of the noise and the hollering and the laughing, you try to get an answer from somebody here. And perhaps one person finally says something like, well, a wonderful thing happened on the way to the cemetery. It began when two processions on a hillside collided that day. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. Soon after Jesus had healed the servant of the centurion, a servant deathly ill, Jesus healed him from a distance with a mere word. Jesus, now traveling south, approaches the village of Nain. They didn't have TV and cell phones and, and newspapers and internet, but they had a really effective doozy of a grapevine in those days. People had heard about Jesus of Nazareth, how he drove forth demonic powers from the suppressed bodies of men, how he preached with authority, how he healed people with a mere word or touch. And now Jesus is on his way up the slope on which the village of Nain is built. On the way out of the city, coming through the gate, there is another procession, a more somber one, a dead person being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. The original language of the Bible uses that word that means, Behold! Here is Jesus with this big crowd behind him going up the hill. Here is this open gate and this somber funeral procession coming down the hill. And the text of the Bible says, Behold! A dead person! being carried out as though to say would you look at that isn't that amazing behold and you say well perhaps it's just a coincidence you know I mean these two processions meeting each other on the hill like that but as you know with the heroes of faith in the Bible and in your own lives too things that we thought were mere accidents or coincidence they were directed by a higher hand. Is this not a marvelous comfort to you and me that we're not chased and driven and stampeded through this life by mere fate or chance, but guided and held by an unseen hand through the wilderness of this world to our home above? So there is this procession, two parades, one led by the Lord of life up the hill, the other the powers of death coming down the hill. A dead person, the only son of his mother, 
and she was a widow. This is not the first time that this woman has followed a body down the hill to the valley of the tombs. She has been through this routine before, placing the body of her husband in the cool of the tomb. And now she must lay her only son in the ground too. And her heart is broken. The one last ray of sunshine in her old age just guttered out. They didn't have social security, nursing homes, and pensions in those days. This was her security and her comfort, and there would be no one now to sit across the table from this poor woman. Two processions, two parades. We're not told what the young man died from. The Bible usually treats this sort of thing as irrelevant. The Bible says that Abraham died at a good old age and full of days. It doesn't tell us whether he died of heart disease, kidney failure, or cancer. Particularly, it doesn't matter. Someday I'm going to stand over the grave of my wife or she's going to stand over my grave. But death is that ultimate statistic. It's one per person. And ultimately, this is what's going to happen. We know this. The Bible does not so much concentrate on the forensic cause of death, whether finally it was caffeine or cholesterol that did me in. But the Lord of life, confronting all the forces of death, this the Bible speaks of. You know, you drive down the highway, kids. You know how it is in the winter around here. You've lived long enough to notice this. All the trees are barren. Everything is cold and lifeless. And this heavy pack of snow lies cold upon everything. And as you look at it, you would say to yourself, well, will leaves and apples and roses ever bloom and come forth from that. Wouldn't seem so, but you know every spring, here the Lord of life meets a procession of death. We have here in this confrontation on this hillside, as these people on a warm day rush their loved one quickly to the tomb, a preview of our Lord's redemptive work of his own life death but triumphant resurrection. We have here a preview of what the old Easter hymn says, while in dread and awful strife met together death and life. We'll see who wins. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. He said, don't cry. He walked up and touched the coffin. Those carrying it stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Preachers have found a really happy sort of thing, you know, when they're getting ready to preach a sermon and they go looking in the four Gospels for some funeral sermon that Jesus preached. There aren't any. He never preached a funeral sermon because Jesus busted up every funeral he ever attended by raising the corpse from the dead. Here, the Lord of life sees the woman and his heart goes out to her. Because the Lord knows. Did you notice what the text of the Bible says when the Lord saw her? If you read Luke's Gospel, you find out that this is one of Luke's favorite titles for Jesus. He loves to simply call him the Lord. 
Of course he knows what she's going through. He is the Lord. He knows all of the thoughts that are racing across her heart and mind. Why me? Why now? Why again? Knows it all. Knows what she's thinking. Now I must trudge the sorry path by myself, all alone. Who's going to hold my hand now in the valley of shadows? He knows. He looks upon her and says, don't cry. He does not say that from some ivy tower far above us. No, the Lord became one of us and went the way of suffering and the cross and then forth on Easter morning to reverse the curse, to make death itself work backward and to melt death's winter into spring. He knows. He walks up to the coffin. Tells them they stop. They just stop. He looks at the young man. He said, young man, he's talking to a corpse. He's talking to a dead body. Young man, I say to you, get up. What other voice could be heard across the great divide? and calls someone back from the dead. Perhaps you remember a line that Jesus spoke from St. John's Gospel. The hour is coming when all that are in their grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. And they shall. One day he shall fling his voice trumpet-like across the graveyards of earth. And just that simply, get up. The Bible says the young man sat up. And he began to talk. Don't you wonder what he said? Or what the people around him said. He began to talk. On that last day, we shall sit up. We'll talk. The first one we'll talk to will be him. And his will be the first face that we see. The tender touch. He gives the young man back to his mother. In token of that day when God shall reunite us and place our hand in the hands of dear ones who have died believing in Christ too. Now, understandably, the people, of course, who see all of this, they are quite astounded. They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Of course they're filled with awe. Whose voice but God's voice could call forth the dead? Whose hand but God's hand could raise someone from the dead? Of course they are astounded at this. That someone could reverse the curse of death itself. And the great prophet has arisen, they said. God has come to visit his people. The rumors spread everywhere. We don't know. 
the Bible does not tell us, how many people in that crowd that day went in dread and awful strife, met together, death and life. How many really knew or recognized who this really was? God himself in the flesh to live and die and rise again for them. But you who sit in these pews for many years, some of you, you kind for man's who are examined today that you might pay forward what you know and in so doing confess what you believe. You and I, we know, we know who he is. We know what he came to do. We know what he has said here. In this place, you have learned of your Lord and Savior. I tell you no secret when I say that all of us here today are in that parade on our way out through the gate and down the hill and to the valley of the tomb. But along the way, a great miracle has happened for you. You have been brought to believe in Him who loved you, who lived and died and rose for you. You have been adopted in the gospel waters of baptism, and you have been raised to a new life. Now someone may ask you, along the way, how is it? How is it that you're in the same parade we're in? They will say to you, you're in this procession too. You're on your way to the cemetery too. How is it? What is it that has so taken hold of your heart and life in the midst of all this death and darkness that is so full of light and joy in your life? And when they ask, you can tell them. Well, a wonderful thing happened on the way to the cemetery. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
crown for men. It has more than one purpose. It does demonstrate that the young people of the congregation have been thoroughly instructed in the teachings of God's Word so that they may properly examine themselves to partake of Holy Communion. It also serves as a good review for the congregation. For some of you, it may have been quite a while since you either memorized or learned some of the truths that you will be hearing today. Now, each year, there are certain introductory basic questions uh, that we ask, which remain the same each year. But the portion of the catechism that we zero in on each year is not known to them until this day. This morning they have been told, and we will be examining them on all of that basic stuff and also on the Lord's Supper, but zeroing in on the three articles of the Apostles' Creed. Even if a person never read the Bible, he would know there's a God. What kind of knowledge is this, Carter? Natural knowledge of God. The natural knowledge of God has two different sources. What would that be, Grace? Nature and conscience. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 4 is an example of the natural knowledge of God. Grant? Every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. What does the Bible say about the atheist in Psalm 14, verse 1? Blake? The Pope says in his heart there is no God. The Bible talks about even the heavenly bodies in Psalm 19, verse 1, telling us that there is a God. Grant? So I have to declare the glory of God disguised by putting the word of his hands. But nature and conscience cannot tell us about what? Both. Who the true God is and what he can do. Where alone do we find the knowledge of our Savior and what he has done for us? Man. The Bible. The Bible is not the word of man, it is the word of God. What's the phrase we sometimes use? To refer to the fact that every word of the Bible is God breathed. Give me. Verbal inspiration. And what is the phrase we use to describe the fact that therefore it is without error? Blake? 2 Timothy 3 15 to 17 uh, tells us about this doctrine of inspiration and how from infancy. Carter. And how can it be? We have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Um, all Scriptures. All Scriptures God created is useful for teaching, for rebuking, and correcting, and training in righteousness, that uh, the man, man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What are the two main parts of the Bible, Timmy? Old New what language was the Old Testament first written in? Both. Mm -hmm. And what language was the New Testament first written in? Grace. Greek. About 400 years after Christ, the Bible was translated into this language, which was the standard language of the church for more than a thousand years. Timmy? Latin. And Martin Luther translated the Bible into what language? Grant. German. And what is the most famous English translation of the Bible, Carter? King James Version. That is correct. What are the two main teachings of the Bible? Maggie? Law and Gospel. Romans 6.23 is a good summary of the difference between law and gospel, though. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life and care to the sorrow. The entire purpose of the Bible is to show us how God sent our Savior Jesus into the world. Please give us a summary of how God brought about the plan of salvation from the time of Adam and Eve until the time of Christ. Timmy. I don't believe that two sons came in and were thinking of the book. God gave them another son and he said, who's promise of the city was passed through. Don't do the one who said, in patriarch, such as Enoch, who was not, because God took him directly to heaven. And the fools of our world is recorded in the Bible 969 years. The only time we the promise of the Savior was passed through Noah, and the one who is of the seven years of the promise of the Savior was passed through Shem. Don't be one of Shem and Hidden, Abraham, and the Father of all faithful. With the one, Solomon was in the Bible, as the two sons of Jacob and Esau, the promise of the Savior was passed through Jacob, who was also called the Lord. Jacob had 12 sons, who were 12 fathers of the tribe of Israel. 
promise you to say you will pass me for some reason, but because of what happened to another son, you may be also become a member of the Egypt and the Lord for 430 years. And then when the final level of honor of God wants us, and when we want to be able to use for 30 years, and then we're going to have a feeling about Joshua. Anybody want to pick it up after the death of Joshua? Grace? After the death of Joshua, in the period of the judges, many of the judges came in the camp and Joshua, the last of the judges of Samuel. Daniel anointed the first king and then Saul from the tribe of Benjamin. After Saul fell away from God, he anointed another king named David from the tribe of Judah. David was a man after God's own heart. He wrote many of the songs. David's son was named Solomon. Solomon was a man after God's own heart. He wrote many of the songs. David's son was named Solomon. Solomon, Solomon was the wisest king of the church of the church and the king of the temple. Solomon was the first king of the church. Solomon son of Rehoboam, during this time the kingdom split over to the north, Judah to the south, and this became known as the period of the divided kingdom. Many of the prophets, such as Isaiah and Jeremiah, did their preaching during this time. In 722 BC, he was leading the tribes and carried away the northern tribes of Israel and the tribes of Israel. In 586 BC, the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and carried away the southern tribes of Judah for 70 years. After 70 years, they were allowed to return and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple under leadership, under leadership of men such as Esther and Nehemiah. After 4 to 5 times centuries, Christ was born in the What book gives us a summary of the basic teachings of the Bible? Carter? Well, I think the book of Revelation. 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 Revelation.
object of Holy Communion for which you have been prepared to uh, properly partake. What is the sacrament of Holy Communion? Kimmy. It's the true body of the In what four chapters of the Bible am I going to find those words of institution that Kenny just recited? Carter? Matthew 26, Mark, Mark 14, Luke 22, and 1 Corinthians 11. That is correct. There are some other chapters which throw some light on the subject of Holy Communion and its meaning. Kimmy? It's in the small book of Holy Corinthians and 1 Corinthians. Second, what blessing do we receive through this eating and drinking? Oh. And it showed us by these words, given and poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins, through these words we re receive the forgiveness of sins, life and salvation through the sacrament. Um, for where there is a forgiveness of sins, there is also a life and salvation. Third, how can eating and drinking do such great things? Timmy? The servant has a community that has such things that these words have been poured out for the forgiveness of sins. These words have been poured out for the sins. Fourth, who then is properly prepared to receive this sacrament? Grace. Fasting and other hour preparation takes no good purpose, but he who is properly prepared to receive first, given and poured out in the name of the king, the Lord has not believed these words of self and is not prepared because it was for you, for I am not being prepared for the Lord. We want to make sure that we properly recognize that we are receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament and also sharing the faith of those who kneel at the same altar for that wonderful assurance of forgiveness. Paul gives us some words of instruction in 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. Therefore, whoever... Grace? Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of blood in a worthy manner is the name of the Father and the Lord. We sometimes refer to this passage to sum everything up as the gospel in a nutshell. Thank For God so wrote the world that he gave his one and only son that his whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is correct. This concludes the examination of the Confirmants for the year 2016. Let us pray for our Confirmants who next Sunday will be confirmed before the Lord's altar. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, who in holy baptism didst begin thy good work in these confirmands, and has given thy blessing to their training, that being instructed in the word of truth, they now look forward to their confirmation and to communing at thy table. Cause their instruction to abound in blessings for their hearts and minds, that in the power of thy Holy Spirit, they may confess their faith with joy and boldness, and praise and glorify thee as their faithful God and Lord. For the sake of Jesus Christ, thy dear Son, our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Thank you.